Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for taking some time to listen to me speak a bit about the situation in Ukraine. I would like to think that we would all be interested if we were talking about struggles and suffering of people in general, because we should all be concerned about our fellow human beings. The reality is most of us are listening and engaging because we're talking about thousands of Jews whose lives are in peril. We feel a special connection to our fellow Jews and we take a special interest in their plight. That's certainly not unique to us. In general, people feel more connected to those with whom they share a common history, culture, religion, ethnicity. But acknowledging my bias, I think Jews are extra special in this regard. Our history going back thousands of years is full of examples of Jews, Jews going out of their way to help other Jews, even risking their own lives to do so. There are certainly many acts of heroism that occurred during all of our crises, the Holocaust being the most significant. And many of those incidents happened in Ukraine, as a matter of fact, which was one of the countries where Jews suffered the very most. So thank you so much for carrying on the story tradition of our people, of caring about other Jews everywhere. The war in Ukraine is worthy of our interest. I think people are starting to lose interest as the war wanes on now. It's been months. It doesn't capture headlines anymore in this country. But I want you all to know that the situation is dire. Most of the Jews in Ukraine remain. The conditions are very difficult. And it's, it's very different than it was after the fall of the Soviet Union when most of the Jews understandably left. Most of the Jews in Ukraine have not left. It's easy for us to say, why don't they just leave? It's not safe. There are other places they can go. We now have the land of Israel welcoming to Jews. But the reality is people don't want to leave their homes. We don't want to leave our homes. The situation in Ukraine is very complicated. In fact, two days ago, I got a picture sent by my boss of a Ukrainian soldier on a train who had his rucksack, his bags with him. <clears throat> and on the bag was a swastika. That's a Ukrainian soldier who's supposed to be protecting our people. And yet, where are his loyalties? What are his motivations? Very complicated. Um, the other reason people aren't leaving Ukraine is because men aged 18 to 62 are eligible for the draft, eligible to serve in the military, and cannot leave. People don't want to leave their husbands, their fathers, their sons, their brothers. So many families have elected to stay. Um, let me just tell you very briefly how I came to be involved in this. Uh, a few months ago, I was asked to manage the Jewish Relief Network Ukraine. We are a direct provider of humanitarian aid in Ukraine. I had spent a few decades working as a leader in the federal government. I speak Hebrew, having spent some years there growing up as a child, and I'm willing to work very hard. Uh, most of my grandparents came from Russia, Poland, Ukraine, a land that changed hands many times. And so it was an honor to be asked to come join some people who are working extremely hard to make a positive difference and save lives. And it has truly been a privilege to be able to contribute. Um, I promise to tell you more about the organization, but let me just give you a little bit of history about the Jews in Ukraine. Um, Ukraine has been a very important um, place for Jews. Many leaders in the Jewish communities going back thousands of years were there, certainly the Baal Shem Tov, um, Shalom Aleichem, the first Lubavitcher rabbi, all come from Ukraine. We can trace Jews in Ukraine and Kiev going back to the 10th century. And during the sixth century, Jews were very prominent, had a tremendously um, significant role in the economy in a system called the Arenda system. We were tax collectors, we ran inns, we sold alcohol, we did very well. By, the 18, by 1800, there were about 1.6 million Jews in Ukraine. We're about 8% of the population, so very, very significant. Fast forward to 1920, about 60% of the Jews in the entire former Soviet Union were in Ukraine. Just before World War II, there was some around two, somewhere around 2.5 million Jews in Ukraine. After the war, after, after the Holocaust, that number was down to um, about a million. 60% of the Jews in Ukraine um, were killed. One of the best known incidents, most, most tragic incidents of World War II occurred right outside Kiev in a place called Babi Yar, where 30,000 Jews were killed in just two days. Um, the anniversary is celebrated every year. It's in September. It was September 1941. Absolutely tragic. After the war, communism. 
Jews were determined to stay in Ukraine and keep Judaism alive. It was actually the Chabad rabbi, uh, the Rebbe, who sent emissaries to Ukraine and determined that they were going to keep shuls open and have schools and teach and keep our history, our heritage, our traditions alive. It was difficult, people died, people were exiled. They would open a synagogue, be discovered, close the synagogue and move elsewhere, but they kept it going. And um, uh, Yitzhak Shamir, Prime Minister of Israel, they actually, the Israeli government in 1950 had sent some folks into Ukraine to try to set up a secret network. And you can imagine their surprise when they found out that the Chabad rabbi um, from New York was already running this secret network, essentially. Soviet Union collapsed 1991. All of a sudden, tremendous opportunities for Jews. There, was about, there were about 500,000 Jews in Ukraine at the time. Half of them went to Israel very understandable who would blame people for wanting to get out. And it was wonderful that Israel existed. They also went to other countries as well, but about half of them left. Um, those who remained were Jewish in terms of heritage, ethnicity, culture, race, if you will, but they knew very little about Judaism because opportunities to teach and learn and practice were very limited. But once there became an opportunity to be involved in a new Jewish community, they were thrilled. The Chabad rabbi was the one who sent three emissaries to Ukraine and decided to rebuild the Jewish communities that had existed prior to World War II. So for 30 years, in fact, um, the Chabad emissaries built Jewish communities in 32 cities, 200 villages. There were more than 30 schools, shuls, community centers, two orphanages, um, let me just explain, because we'll talk about orphanages just a bit later. Orphanages, orphanages in Ukraine are for children who have been abandoned, essentially, by their mother, but they are not legal orphans, so they cannot be adopted. They are social orphans. Ukraine has always been very, very poor, and many mothers are unable to take care of the children. The fathers are not part of their lives for a variety of reasons. The mothers are unemployed, they have mental health issues, they have substance abuse issues. So they bring the children to the community center and they say, please take care of my child. They're not giving away their child, but they want help. So in fact, the children are raised in these homes, but every effort is made to keep the mother, the grandparents, anybody that is around involved with that child. So as a matter of fact, two orphanages, one from Odessa and one from Shatomer, were evacuated in the early days of the war. Not only were the children taken, but the relatives of the children were taken as well. So there's a community in addition to the orphans that we moved because the, the hope is that the child will return to the mother. So when I say orphans, it's not orphans like we think of, um, but there are sad situations and it's wonderful that we have the ability to take care of them and support them while also trying to bring uh, the mothers back into their lives. So in addition to the schools and the community centers and the schools, um, we have summer camps. Um, a whole social services network was built beginning in 1991. People who were engaged in our communities, in the Chabad communities, are probably 80 to 90% of the Jews in Ukraine. They don't look Chabad. They don't practice Judaism like Chabad. Um, they, they don't know that much even now, but they, we are the biggest game in town. And in many places, we're the only game in town. There are certainly other players in Ukraine always have been that provide support and social services. So you have the Joint Distribution Committee. You've got the, United, you've got, um, the Jewish Agency. You have ORT. You have um, Hillel. So there are organizations in Ukraine. I don't mean to suggest that there aren't, but we are by far, by far the largest organization. And so many, many, many of the Jews, 80 to 90% of Jews in Ukraine are known to us, receive our social services, go to our schools, go to our summer camps. We really have been the Jewish community in Ukraine. By 2014, Ukraine had the third largest Jewish community in Europe and the fifth largest in the world. Quite extraordinary, really. Uh, most of the Ukrainian Jews live in four cities, in Kiev, um, 
Dnipro, Kharkov, and Odessa. Nevertheless, despite the fact that we were a large Jewish community, just to give you some context, we were less than 1% of the population in Ukraine. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, on the slideshow that maybe you can see, maybe you have seen, there is a beautiful picture of the Menorah Center in Dnipro. It was built in 2012, and it truly is a testament to what the Jewish community in Ukraine had become. It was a $100 million building with event halls, synagogues, spa-like mikvahs, kosher restaurants. Um, it had banks for Israeli, um, Ukraine, Ukraine dual nationals, served tens of thousands of people. Uh, 22 floor, 22 story menorah, just towering over the, the city skylines. Just incredible. The $100 million all came from local people. This was not funding that came from the United States or from Europe. This was Ukrainian Jewish oligarchs who invested in their communities. It was really quite extraordinary. War breaks out. February, no, I'm sorry, let me back up. Prior to February 24th many rumors about a war. There have been wars obviously in countries of the former Soviet Union over the past, in the past decade, and Chabad had a presence in those countries. So we kind of had an idea of what might happen and we had learned from prior experiences as to what needed to be done. Um, and I would just say I was at the General Assembly of the, Gener the Jewish Federations of North America last weekend and heard from all the different organizations that have been doing work in Ukraine before the war um, and now today. And it, it was interesting that there was widespread agreement that in fact, the Chabad community were the ones who were the most prepared and um, who were able to have the greatest impact. Lots of people have done a lot of great work. Some have left, some are still there. We all worked very closely together but it was nice to, to hear the acknowledgement of um, our preparation pre-war and then what we did during the war. So pre-war, what did we do? We put satellite phones in all the communities because we knew communications go first. We had lots and lots of cash taken out of the banks so that we would have ready resources to pay for evacuations. Um, we had talk to all the Chabad rabbis. At that time, there were about 150 Chabad rabbis around the country. We told them all to prepare the communities to have um, areas set up in the community centers, in the synagogues, where we had lots of supplies. We were ready, we were ready. Um, and we spoke a lot with the Minister of Diaspora Affairs. We were very close to the Israeli government. In fact, um, shortly after the war broke out, we got a lot of money from the Israeli government to help with the support efforts. Um, they knew what we knew. They knew we knew what to do. So February 24th, 2022, the war breaks out. We immediately converted our social services network into a humanitarian relief and rescue operation. We housed and fed people in the community centers, in the schools, in the schools. We coordinated escapes from the front lines into other parts of Ukraine, as well as to Israel and to Europe. We had planes, trains, automobiles um, leaving the country. We um, fed 42,000 people. We provided medicine to 4,500 people. We provided temporary housing to 12,000 people. We had 55 secure locations where we could keep um, supplies and people on and on and on. Um, we were absolutely Chabad to the rescue and worked closely with the um, Jewish agency and JDC to mobilize all the resources that could possibly be pulled together to help people get across the border or to move to other parts of Ukraine um, where it was more safe after the initial um, onslaught. It was great that everybody worked so hard at the beginning and, and got things stabilized, but it became clear very early on that there was gonna be a need for ongoing and regular support of a lot of people. The war was not gonna go away anytime soon. In the, first, in the first half of 2022, so after the war broke out and then for the next few months, 12,000 people left for Israel. And that is certainly a lot. The, the total for 2021 was only 3,000. So yes, a lot of people left. Some of those people came back, um, 
but many, many people remain. 12,000 people out of a couple hundred thousand it isn't that significant. So Chabad um, in the former Soviet Union has been operated, but has, has had a social services umbrella organization that has been operating for about 30 years. It is called the Federation of Jewish Communities. It is overseen by two rabbis, Rabbi David Munchine, who is in Moscow, and Rabbi Shlomi Pellets, who is in Israel. They coordinate with the Chabad rabbis all over Ukraine, and they oversee all of these social services and um, programs that I mentioned, whether it's camps or schools or orphanages or community centers, um, food, medicine, whatever it is. The Federation of Jewish Communities of the former Soviet Union was the one doing all the work in Ukraine, but realized fairly quickly that they had a problem and that they needed to section off the Ukraine operations from the rest of their operations. A couple of reasons for that. One, if you go to their website, even today, and I hope you do, um, you will see pictures of Putin. And I think that that's not a great surprise to anybody. Putin had been um, fairly close to the Jews in Russia and has allowed the Jews in Russia to do things no one else had done before. Um, so there it is. It's not good if you're in Ukraine and you're helping people and you're asking people to help Ukrainians and you've got Vladimir Putin on your website when he's the one that's causing the very problems that we're trying to solve. Um, let me just take a moment actually to mention something I should have mentioned at the beginning. What I just described, the very complicated relationship, I would say, between many Jews in Russia and, um, well, just for Jews in general right now, because of Russia, we don't talk about the war as such. We're helping people who are in the situation that they're in because of the war. We all know why we're at war. We know who was behind it. But we stay away from the politics for a variety of reasons, much as the state of Israel stays away from the politics. But as I said, one of the leaders of our organization is in Moscow. And so as you can imagine, it's complicated and complex if one were to wade into the politics. So we do not. Same, that, that is part of the reason why we created a new organization called um, Jewish Relief Network Ukraine. It is the same people running it who run the Federation of Jewish Communities who have been doing this work for 30 years and know everybody in the community. But we wanted to have our own identity so that when we are talking to people in this country, in Europe, in Israel, we don't have to have all the baggage of the Federation of Jewish Communities right there in everybody's face. It was not, particularly good to have uh, our staff, our workers in Ukraine with an emblem, a logo that has Russia on it from the Federation of Jewish Communities. So we did a rebranding and created Jewish Relief Network Ukraine to oversee, coordinate, implement the relief effort, efforts that have been going on in Ukraine. One of the big problems that we face is that the funding for the Federation of Jewish Communities over these 30 years came from a lot of oligarchs. That funding is no longer available. Some of the people that had been funding us for 30 years are now in our soup kitchen, as a matter of fact, because they don't have money anymore. So we needed a new name, we needed a new identity, we needed to tell the world what was going on and what we needed, created Jewish Relief Network Ukraine. Today, about 35,000 people rely on Jewish Relief Network Ukraine on a daily basis to support them and help them we are able to help and support what other organizations can't because of our longstanding connections. So there have been at times off and on when nobody can get to Kherson, it has been completely cut off and the aid organizations can't get supplies. Israel, A, JDC, you name it. Well, because we have such a strong presence in Russia, we are able to get to Kherson from the Russian side and get supplies into Kherson and help the people. In the 35 different, um, Jewish communities across 32 cities, and then we have all the villages. We know the mayor, we know the chief of police, we know the military guy, we know the pharmacists and the grocery stores, we know where we can put warehouses. We are so embedded in the community, so we can reach these 35,000 people. We are giving them food and medicine and coordinate, coordinating medical and mental health services. We are buying diapers and formula. We are supporting the refugees in the two orphanages, one in Israel, one in Berlin. We have refugees in other parts of Europe we're supporting as well. 
we operate soup kitchens. Today, there's 15 soup kitchens as we had to shut some of them down um, and move some as the population has moved in Ukraine. We provide uh, food packages. We have been very fortunate to over uh, the past few months, not so much today, but early on in the war, get tons of food literally delivered up, supplied by OU. We have had donations from other organizations. We have medicine supplied by AmeriCares for free to us that we are able to get to the people. As much as possible, we have tried to source things in Ukraine when it's available. The economy obviously is terrible. People have lost their jobs. Inflation is spiraling upward. They have no money. To the extent possible, we want to support the economy. So if we can buy food in Ukraine, it's cheaper, certainly, than shipping it halfway across the world. And it's better to try to do that. We also would like to let people do and buy what's best for their families. So we would like to, so we give them grocery store certificates, for example, at Slippo, I think is the name of the grocery store. We will give them a hundred dollar voucher. They can then go buy the food that they need for their family rather than us putting together packages that may or may not meet their needs. So our approach is comprehensive and multifaceted in terms of food, for example. It's grocery store vouchers, it's food packages, and it's soup kitchens. Depending who needs what, who can get where, that's how we, we handle it. Um, great example of a story, some of you may remember in Venetia at the end of July, I believe, terrible bombing. I woke up that morning and had several videos sent to me by a woman named Tanya, who works for us. She's actually, um, she's Bulgarian from Venetia. Uh, I'm sorry, she's Ukrainian from Venetia, living in Bulgaria. She fled the war um, very early on because she was pregnant and had a child that she delivered in Bulgaria. But her grandmother's in Venetia. Her mother has died. Her grandma has no one there. Tanya was panicked after um, the bombs went off and she could see the buildings destroyed and she saw people bringing people out of the buildings. Our staff went door to door checking out people and in fact, Tanya's grandmother was okay, which was wonderful. The next day we did a food package distribution at the community center. Tanya's grandmother was not there. Without any intervention by Tanya or me or anyone else, the aid workers are some of our 2000 staff who are boots on the ground in Ukraine went to Tanya's grandmother's house and got her and brought her to the community center and gave her her food package and took her home. They knew she should have been there. They knew she was missing and they were concerned. That's how well our staff know the people in this community because we've been there for so long. Uh, this fall, there were some new challenges in addition to our usual um, distribution of humanitarian aid. School was set to start. These kids in Ukraine have had disruptions as people have in other parts of the world as a result of COVID. And then the war shut schools down. So many of these kids have not had an opportunity to be in the classroom. More needed now probably than most other times, kids have spent a lot of time in bomb shelters. Some have had to flood their home, flee their homes with almost nothing. Many of um, these kids' fathers are gone serving in the military. So a lot of trauma. School is an opportunity for kids to go and have support from teachers and other administrators and their friends. So we wanted to get kids in classrooms as much as we could. The Ukrainian government, I think wisely, required schools to have bomb shelters readily available for the teachers and the students to go to if something should happen. And these weren't bomb shelters where you would go for five or 10 minutes. These were bomb shelters where you may have to spend half a day. So the government required that the bomb shelters be readily accessible, have a generator, have food and water, and be outfitted like a classroom so the kids would be comfortable there and not traumatized. It's a great idea, but it was very expensive and difficult to pull off. Many schools had no bomb shelters. Those that did were you know, old, dirty, wet, et cetera. So we set about to outfit schools with bomb shelters. And um, if you see this, the slideshow, you'll see some great pictures of the kids. So we were able to open 13 schools, send the kids there with new backpacks full of school supplies and toys that were actually donated um, for the local communities. Some had stuff and we were able to get some folks with money to, to help out and get these kids back into school and some sense of normalcy. Kids had moved from one community to the other and we were still able to accommodate them. Kids who aren't in school, are mostly trying to learn online, but as you can imagine, the infrastructure is not great, especially with the disruptions of the power source. So 
that's something that we got some grants for and have continued to raise money and continue to focus on. Uh, getting kids in school has been very, very important. Another challenge in the past few months have been the tremendous number of displaced people in Ukraine. There are more displaced people in Ukraine than anyone anywhere else in the world, according to the UN. There was an article yesterday in the Times of Israel about how much movement there has been in country. So some cities like Mariupol have been occupied for a long time and there are basically no Jews there. Kharkov has been under siege and many of the Jews have left. And so communities that were very small in the past, like Lvov had 600 Jews, now have 2000 Jews. Um, Ivano Franvisk, it's hard for me to say, went from 150 Jews to 1,000 Jews. So we have adapted our resources and moved them around with help from um, the Chabad rabbis, boots on the ground, the staff, the volunteers, so that we can serve people where they are. One city, Nikolayev, has had a lot of difficulties. Most recently, you may have seen stories over the past month where the water source has been completely, um, uh, I can't think of the word, the water is no good. Um, so if you turn the faucet on, you get brown, bubbly water. It is not only not drinkable, you can't shower in it, and it's corroding the pipes. So we have been in Nikolaya for the past weeks digging a 50-foot well. In addition to giving out lots of fresh water and bottles, et cetera, we're trying to provide them a new water source. So that has been a recent challenge. Uh, the displaced people we have in hotels and apartments and little cabins and campgrounds, essentially, to uh, address the movement around the country that is fairly temporary, but who knows? So we are accommodating people there. The high holidays provided an important opportunity to give people some sense of normalcy, some joy. Um, we think it's very important to try to address their mental health and their um, emotional well-being. There's been some numbers that came out over the past six months about the level of depression, very understandably, in Ukraine. The High Holidays provided an opportunity for us to go above and beyond our usual food distribution and medicine. We put together more than 30,000 boxes for Rosh Hashanah that had honey that we actually were able to produce at a factory in Ukraine that was made kosher, and honey cakes and honey cookies and coloring books and other things. And for Sukkot, we were able to put together another 30,000 set of packages of um, um, all kinds of things for Sukkot, including the, the four essential items. And people built Sukkot and went to Sukkot in um, the community centers and were able to enjoy some sense of normalcy, some sense of community. For Simchat Torah, we, put, we created flags and gave those to the kids with a bunch of candy as well. And that was very, very important. And we're very proud that we were able to do that um, for these people who are really struggling. The last thing I want to mention is the current challenge is power. Power um, has been a target of the Ukrainian, of the Russian. Uh, BBC had a story uh, recently that over the past month, one third of the power stations have been destroyed. So the Ukrainian government has been limiting power to people. There has been um, 4 million people whose power was temporarily disconnected off and on. People have been required to use the energy very sparingly. There's a fact, in fact, on the internet, you can find charts that the electrical company in Ukraine put out telling people which appliances they could use when because it was so critical to conserve what limited energy that there was. We have bought large generators for the schools and community centers and have been distributing those to the tune of about a million dollars. The much more expensive um, items for us have been the thousands of sleeping bags and um, water and battery packs and coats and um, sterno so people can warm up um, food and blankets and individual generators. Um, $5 million worth of supplies. We have a laundry list of things we've been purchasing. Very fortunate to have support from uh, Chabad in the United Kingdom and other synagogues in the United Kingdom who are donating things to us. We have groups here who are donating things to us. We've gotten some grants um, also for this. The Jewish Federation of North America has been very generous to support us. First time they've given to Chabad, as a matter of fact. Uh, United Jewish Appeal in New York has given us money as well. And so we have been of late spending a lot of the money on preparing for the winter. 
we are very concerned. Ukraine is very, very cold. Um, I said it was last thing. One more last thing. Security is a concern. Early on in the war, the Ukrainian government handed out weapons to people. They then asked for those weapons back. No big surprise, not everything came back. Ukrainian soldiers bring weapons back from, from the front lines and Russian soldiers have abandoned weapons and they've been picked up by Ukrainian citizens. Everybody has a weapon, scary, dangerous. We have tried to um, train our staff in the schools and in the community centers about what they should do. We are not arming them, but we are teaching them. We have hardened some of our facilities to the extent we've been able to, the community centers, the schools, the synagogues, making it more difficult if somebody were to try to come in and um, do harm to somebody. It is very, very scary. And we know that during the winter, people are gonna become more desperate and people who are desperate and scared um, do bad things, weapons allow for real harm to come. So that's another area of concern for us and we're doing what we can. Um, I appreciate you listening to all this. Hopefully it wasn't rambling too much. I would like to shout out some of our major partners. I wish I had the list in front of me. Um, Restoring Vision just sent us a 100,000 pairs of glasses. As I said, OU has supplied us tons of food. Um, Chabad, Jewish Federations of North America, AmeriCares is sending us, I think our third or fourth supply of um, medicine and medical supplies that have been just absolutely critical. International Fellowship of Christians, Christians and Jews, tremendous partner of ours, have been supporting Jews in the former Soviet Union and in Ukraine for a very long time, and they have been wonderful partners of ours during the war. The Israeli government has been a wonderful partner of ours as well. I hope I haven't left anybody major out, um, but I would love for you to look at our website if you have time. It is www dot jrnu.org. We try to post stories twice a week to really give you a personal feel for what's going on in Ukraine. Um, a wonderful man from Detroit who wanted to get involved and help raised a good amount of money for the orphanage in Berlin, the orphanage that left Odessa. He actually has traveled there this past week. He wanted to see where his money was going. So he was in Berlin, now he's in Odessa and he is blogging about his visit and he is posting videos. That is also available on our website. If you wanna take a look, you can see um, what he has found. And I think it's been tremendously impactful for him. So thank you so very much. I hope you're able to see the slideshow. It has details that I've either, either forgotten or confused and I apologize. I would love to speak to any one of you who's interested, please reach out. My email is ygarrett, G-A-R-R-E-T-T -T, at jrnu.org. Love to be in touch, love to share additional information, love to come speak to any group that would like to listen, love to have a discussion, not so much a one way me talking, but um, actually have a discussion, um, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so very much. All the best.